Okay, so I know we already start kind of uh, being late. So let's get started. Um, so I have not made any slides. Uh, obviously, you know, very much short notice for me to do anything. So, you know, as is the norm, let's uh, <coughs> go through the, uh, you know, the lesson that was done and uh, take in everybody's inputs. Uh, in fact, an intense lesson as uh, we all must have uh, realized and seen. You know, started with uh, creating rest nets and uh, units and being able to go to RNNs and, and so forth. Pretty, pretty intense, I would say. Something that I personally think that each of those sub blocks, uh, if you were to do, would take you know, quite a good amount of time. So, you know, that being the, uh, the, the case, uh, but it really gives a lot of food for thought and practice, as Jeremy put it. Uh, if we were to take this as a starting point and look at what would be there for the second part of the course, right? Uh, I'm personally trying to use at least a few of uh, what was there in that lessons and seeing if I can apply that uh, to, uh, you know, one of the Kaggle competitions that I'm currently in, which is the humpback wheel. And I personally feel that uh, the ResNet blocks, I could create probably a, a, a ResNet architecture myself, where instead of using the custom three channels that I need to use for uh, pre-trained ResNet architecture, I could probably do this and create a, a channel see how it kind of trains. So that would be interesting. I'm going to give it a shot uh, next week and that would be really good. Uh, I want to kind of open this up and, and take all of your uh, feedback and suggestions as to what you thought about the lesson and how we could kind of take this forward. Any, any thoughts from uh, any of you regarding the lesson seven? Sorry, just, just joined. Uh, yeah, it's a nice lesson. Um, and, and very busy, as you said, and Jeremy said. Uh, and we are we're setting up our, our study groups to continue, I think, last time. Um, maybe we could also later open the, uh, the Google Doc and, uh, and see which Kaggle competition we could do. Sure. sure. Do you want me to share the share it on the screen? Yeah, we could. Yeah. Yeah. Let me try that. Just a minute. Are you guys able to see my screen? Yes, yes, I can see. Yeah. Okay, great. So this is what I think uh, Heather uh, had put together and, uh, you know, kind of asked for people as to what they pick of the competitions or type of uh, data that they would like to kind of look at. I have yeah. gone through this and, um, and I have made my own uh, choices. I think uh, Mikkel has also done that. Yeah. So, no, it's 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 a mixture of everything: uh, computer vision, structural tableau data, collaborative filtering, NLP, GAN, and so forth. Be worthwhile for uh, you know all of us to kind of go this, go through this, and pick uh, uh, you know a competition of your choice and see you know where we reach. I don't see anybody apart from Michael and myself and probably Heather having added some of the competitions. Maybe now that the course is over, you can kind of go through and pick your choice and see what we like to do. Yeah, so we thought that we thought that we could do a weekly meeting still and, uh, and just, 
yeah, present projects, competitions, what we're working on. So the Kaggle was was a choice, uh, of course. And there's many many competitions at Kaggle, so we kind of decided to uh, to pick some competitions, team up, if if that's something that uh, um, maybe could work as well to work to, to kind of like also learn to work as a team. Um, so yeah, if anyone is interested uh, to either join any competition that already have some members, so just pick a competition from the list or any other project, that's also fine. And that, that could be the way forward between now and the part two course. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's some, some in line to what Jeremy said that uh, we need to code, we need to practice. Uh, of course, doing Kaggle competitions is also co uh, writing code and practicing, so that's uh, that makes sense for sure. Or do, do you guys have any 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 other plans, or do you want to go for part two? And and if yes, what you are going to do in between? A question to the group. I, I was thinking about. Uh, have you seen this um, this forum um, about uh, time series analysis on on the Fast AI uh, channel? They they do their kind of own internal channel uh, challenges for time series analysis, like a special interest group. On that, list. okay, that was something that I was interested in as well, like just in general because like I have time series data at work quite often. So I thought I, I snoop around, but I was really busy last week, so I didn't really participate. Yeah. They they started already, this kind of stuff like like one uh, D CNNs and uh, attention models, or I don't know what they what they like test but all kinds of stuff but dedicated to time series do they do they have like a study group like ours or do they also do they only have the online this uh, this chat thread I, or I think they're just in this uh, one topic in the part one version three um category um yeah that sounds interesting i'm, I'm looking for the for the link i'll post it in the chat yeah I think they they have teamed up uh, for the plastic uh, astronomical uh, competition. Yeah, yeah, that might be. I mean, they they've been doing the stuff for a couple of weeks now already, and there seem to be quite uh, some advanced people in there as well. So that's okay. why they they cannot uh, release the, the discussion between them because it's an online uh, live competition, as you know. Right. Well, it will be good to join them if they advanced, so you can get a good uh, position on the leaderboard. <laughs> Just joke. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. That's good. So that's... I, I was browsing their kind of chats and uh, looked looked quite interesting, but I couldn't really dive into too much stuff going on. But yeah, I posted in the, in the chat. It's a time series sequential data study group. Yeah, to be honest, I mean, I, I'm almost fine with everything. I just need something that other people are working at, and then I will probably just hop in. So I, I'll have to read your your table first as well. So I was wasn't really doing that. Sorry. Yeah, we put a lot of competitions. Haider uh, put a lot of competitions in there. Uh, of course, with, yeah, um, it would be nice to work as a team, but also individual work is fine. And then the idea was to kind of to share the learnings weekly. Yeah. So that's that's the that's kind of, and just practice. I think that's what Jeremy said. Just, just code, just practice. That's what counts. <laughs> of course, we could be open for like mini presentations, as we are where so far. That's so, yeah, everything pretty much open, I guess. Anyone else got any other ideas um, on what to do between now and the March? I was wondering, is someone else like? I feel that my PyTorch stuff is a bit. Uh, shallow. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm wondering who else wants to dive in more into, into the actual PyTorch stuff because I don't know, I bumped into some shortcomings in fast AI since it changed so often quite quite frequently now already. So I think in the end, you, I mean, something that you can always use is the data loader stuff and, and data API, but um, I have the feeling that quite often you would need to write your own Python stuff and Jeremy is kind of doing that in the end anyway, in, in the course as well. So I was wondering if it's worthwhile to, I don't know if, if there's a specific kind of focus that it's lacking at the moment. I'm, I trust not, I'm just not 
uh, deep enough into it that I know that something is lacking in my knowledge, right? It's just a bit of a feeling that it's a bit, yeah, it could be more profound. I was wondering if, I don't want to do like a full PyTorch kind of course. I was just wondering if it's worthwhile to dig into some aspects of it or if, mm. how, how you guys feel. Yeah. There's that free, um, there's that free course in PyTorch from Udacity that uh -huh. I, I, was, I was looking at that and I was thinking that might be worthwhile to do during the intro. Okay. I have already started that course. Uh, I'm now in good. I, I, th I think I think the quality is good. In the <laughs> I don't. I think you need the mic to 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 be. I know the audio is bad. Uh, somebody needs to mute the puppies. I don't know where it's coming from. Let me mute everybody and then, you know, whomsoever is speak can unmute themselves. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. I think if you are planning to get uh, the, the, the the second part of a fast AI course, then PyTorch is a must. Uh, last time, last year, I I, I, I checked part two. It is much more difficult, and 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 um, and without without a solid ground in PyTorch, I think it's, it would be not easy. So uh, I think Udacity courses is a good choice. Now I'm I'm, I'm in week two in uh, Udacity PyTorch course. And it's, it's it's really good, so so I, I I really suggest if you are interested to get part two to get the Udacity course now. So my take on this is slightly different, right? I agree with you know the fact that we need to understand PyTorch uh, really well, but I guess you know you're not going to do that in a in a short period of time. It's going to take some uh, really good practice and time spent to get there. So what I thought would be a good approach to do is to see, uh, for example, right now I'm doing the humpback whale uh, competition. See whatever we are doing in fast AI, can we do it in plain PyTorch and see where, where, what we're getting and where we're getting. Uh, there are a number of kernels out there as well, which uh, kind of replicate um, all of these results just on pure PyTorch. And that could be a good you know, way of uh, you know, kind of understanding PyTorch and taking it forward. Uh, I've heard good reviews, just like Haider said about the Udacity PyTorch course uh, as well, and uh, that also something. You know, if it's not time intensive, that's that's something people can look at. Um, regarding the the course uh, version two, is is there anything known apart from that it's going to start like early March? Is there like a like a timeline for applying again, so we don't miss that, or is that not announced yet? Has anyone seen something? No, I don't think there is any pointers until now as to what would be the process of getting something like a fast AI live again for the part two course. But as has been the norm for the previous course, I would assume that would be somewhere around February that we would start getting something to kind of apply and uh, be onboarded onto the course. Uh, and normally, you know, it's, you know, I have not seen Jeremy saying no to international fellowships for the second part, right? It's, it's either you're there for the first and second or you're not there. So that's the kind of uh, stuff. Okay. Yeah, I think I saw a message somewhere, maybe from Rachel, that said that we would be notified and that it would run, that it, there would be the same option to take the course online um, that we had for the first course. So uh, I'm not too worried about that. I'm sure we'll get notified when it's time. Okay. Yeah, so on, on the chat, there's another um, uh, topic uh, mentioned, the reinforcement learning, something that Sam was also trying to gauge interest and there were a couple of people interested. So that could be another um, study group as such. Of course, that's a lot different than FastAI, as FastAI is not doing reinforcement learning so far. So and Probably not in the future either because of the comments. Yeah. There. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Not um, to be honest, I mean, I, I was kind of intrigued, and I'm reading some some stuff, the packed book about uh, deep reinforcement learning. But I, for for me personally, I I want to get more solid in in 
just deep learning for the moment, I guess. I'll do it just to get a bit of a grasp, like how it could apply to my stuff, but um, I'll probably step back. Although I was kind of intrigued in, in the beginning when Sam said so, but I'll probably kind of focus because. Yeah, it's a lot. It's already a lot. It's vision, NLP, collaborative. Uh, it's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff. <laughs> Anyone thought about the uh, documentation improvement um, that they, 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 they're asking for help on improving the docs or helping with the library? And um, so I was thinking of looking into that a little bit too, uh, in addition to whatever we're going to do here. Um, um, has anybody thought about that yet? Yeah, I think it's a good idea because you're going to learn as well. Uh, you need to understand how the how the code works so you can document it. Yeah, I, mean, I was thinking about something. Yeah. Sorry, that was something I would be interested in, but um, I haven't really contributed to like a uh, like docu documentation or whatever. So I, there would be something maybe uh, cool if you could report on that. Like if you actually do that, like basically how the kind of workflow worked and then um, just pull requests or whatever, to, like just like a 10 minute thing. Uh, because I guess that it's kind of a hurdle for people who haven't really contributed to open source, how involved. Yeah, I, I've never done that either. And I've always thought that would be kind of cool to do. And they're encouraging people to do it, even if you haven't. Um, they're, they're saying that you can help out even if you're not one of these people who sit up at night contributing to open source libraries and stuff. Um, yeah. They're saying that you can do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and okay, it's, uh, can you be a bit more specific? Like, what what would that be about? Like, like uh, individual functions, or or uh, what what's the what, um, what, what are you looking for? I'm not entirely sure, but I did set. I just put up a link that um, 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 Sylvan Gugger um, yeah. wrote a, a post uh, inviting everyone to help, and I just put that. I just um, posted that on our chat, so. You can have a look. Yeah, he's he's basically saying you can you can just pick whatever you like to contribute. Could be like a small part, a bigger part. Yeah, so whatever you can do, like if you want to start with a small section, that's fine. That's what I understood. I mean, so it's can... just as simple as uh, as taking a function that hasn't been explained very well, has that they don't have documentation for it, and then exploring yeah. what it does, and then writing up a little, you know, paragraph about about what it does as, as the documentation. Yeah. So okay. Can be done. Kind of interesting, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's another idea. So so basically I think and anything's fine and, and then we could just report on a weekly basis whoever done it something mm -hmm. and that, that could be fine. The another thing we would need to think about is like how to organize it, you know, how who's going to open the calls, who's going to you know make like a little agenda. Because that's quite some weeks. Uh, like, yeah, like three months, yeah. like 12 weeks. Yeah. So I guess, again, for one person to manage all of that's going to be quite a lot of com uh, commitment, big commitment. So maybe we should put like a like an agenda on a Slack and, and anyone could pick like a date that they're going to host the meeting maybe. Yeah, I think, I mean, if, I don't know how that works in the in the deep learning one here, but for the machine learning one, was kind of working okay, right? With like three or four guys, like rotating. And even if yeah. you can't do it, that was kind of easy. I mean, obviously in the end, kind of dropped off a little bit, <laughs> but uh, that was working fine. If it's like one or two, I think it could be a bit tedious, but if like three or four, like every third or fourth week to, to just start the call and then just do the, the intro talking. I mean, it's it's gonna be a lot less formal anyway, right? With with the course, you have to kind of prepare the slides and you have to kind of at least rewatch the lesson to know what's going on in the at least in the machine learning one. Mm -hmm. um, so I envision that this one will be, yeah. I mean, the other one wasn't really uh, taking a big toll, but like one or two hours was maybe uh, to invest. So this one should be E more easy and, and quicker, I envision, but three or four people would probably do it, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. it's, yeah. we'll put like a little agenda and then we are, we just ask people to fill the names, something similar to the Kaggle doc, doc, document. Okay, great. 
Yeah, it's, so so in, in, in general, uh, to, to recap, there was kind of the, um, whatever we, we, we do with uh, tech competitions or just kind of projects or what, then maybe like reports, if people are doing actual contributions, that would be really interesting to me. Like basically here, this one was the function. I just put this up, blah, blah, blah. That's how I did it. And uh, also, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to read on stuff, but there's so much published at the moment. It's really crazy. But these kind of mini reviews were, were always kind of fun when, when they were happening. So if anyone has like a five or 10 minute thing, that could be something also to just share. I, guess. I think that's great uh, if, because we're all probably trying to read or not, or, or at least some of us are probably trying to read papers and understand them and that's time consuming. But once you've read it, if you spend a little extra time just making some notes on it and then presenting it to everybody else, I think that would accelerate everybody's learning. Yeah. So basically what I, what I like myself, what I did in the last months was really like collecting, I don't know, probably 50 to hundred papers that on my list, like you should really read that, but it's like a big pile at the moment. But, it's going to yeah. take a couple of years. Yeah, yeah but I, I probably <laughs> kind of saw it, which is really important. And, and I, I wanted to make it a habit basically to read one a week and then yeah. kind of do like a small summary on the side and maybe maybe they, then something comes from it. You know what would be nice if... if I'll try to do that too, yeah. From, from the technical side, it would be nice if the documentation that Jeremy is writing and, and Fast AI, if, if, it, if, it, if it had like a dark theme, you know, some dogs, especially if you have like a books, you can change the background. And uh, so maybe if someone is on a call who knows how to do it, maybe maybe could send some instructions to Jeremy. You know, so because of like, if you read that white screen all night long, it's going to, uh, I cannot, I cannot do that anymore. Like I switched a couple programs to dark theme and I cannot read the white screen anymore. Like during night, it's like, so annoying. So I'm just looking now for at everything to switch to that theme. Can you just and, uh, flip like the Safari or whatever? Can you just invert that? I haven't tried it. Yeah. So that's what you that's what you want to do basically. But mm -hmm. it's not always possible. Uh, I mean, like Firefox on mobile on iOS, it's got that dark theme. It basically converts even yeah. white pages into dark theme. But it's not on it's not a desktop. Uh, so uh, okay, in, just a, in, in Chrome. Do you use Chrome browser in, in desktop? I there do. Is have, a, yeah. Yeah, there is a plugin very very neat uh, for, for for this. It it's called D Luminate. Uh, okay. I will send, I will send it in. The yeah, chat. that was great. That was great. Yeah, yeah that's thank you for that. That's a side uh, side uh, <laughs> project. Um, but, uh, um, that's what, the, uh, sorry, yeah. I was just wondering, uh, should we kind of? I don't know, create a channel in Slack w with most worthy papers for ourselves. Basically, if someone read it, basically write like a paragraph why it's a good paper and just link them. Are, are you kind of collecting stuff or it's, it's probably worthwhile because there's so much stuff. I find it really hard to, to, to pick the good ones. Yes, yeah. I think that would be great. So maybe we, we should just do a, like a, like a, like a literature channel. And then I don't know if there's a better, better way structuring it or collecting stuff and not only a link to the to the archive or whatever but also like a really tiny like three sentence summary what's yeah. why it's a good paper and, and and yeah so maybe i i suggest that to sam okay yeah so there, there there are a lot of interesting papers like from from the new reaps conference uh which was live on facebook as well there was mm -hmm. one paper there was one paper on the transfer learning that's what jeremy is teaching all the time yeah. But they concluded basically that the the kind of weight transfers that Jeremy is using is, is one of the kind of least uh, performing transfers and there are better ones. I think that was interesting. I could put a link on that as well. Yeah. That sounds yeah. cool, yeah. I mean, what what other transfer can you do? Can you Do you know? Yeah, they, they, I didn't really go into detail in that paper. There was five minutes. So what they did, they had a lot of papers presented there and they only had like five minutes to present that paper. Okay, and then they, okay. yeah, yeah and, and then they had like a, a, um, posters somewhere in this, in this uh, conference. And then if you were interested in the five minute talk, you could go to them and then basically you could discuss uh, what was interesting for you. So, but I'll, I'll find it out. Uh, uh, okay. I think they, they, they presented like three different ways to, to do transfer learning. And there was one which was clearly like 
best in all types of uh, data mm -hmm. and, and different. Uh, I'm really curious, so, yeah, because I mean, there's yeah. really much more than weights. So I'm wondering what you <laughs> what you can transfer. But yeah, it should be interesting. Yeah. I mean, one thing I'm really intrigued by, but it's probably, yeah, I don't really know how effective that's going to be, is, is really getting more into the guns. And there was something from the last lesson where I thought, okay, that was kind of okay. Did that check mark, but it wasn't really, I mean, that, it was too short to get a sense for like what you can do with that. And there's so many varieties and, and changes and, and, and crossovers. I don't know. It, and they feel, to me, that they feel to be like really finicky. I'm not really sure. I don't know. Are you guys using guns or have, are you exploring them or is it like a bit because they, they take so much time to train quite often? Anyone doing that? So my, I have always stayed away from GANs, right from my first Udacity course on deep learning till now. Whenever I come to GAN, I've kind of given up. Uh, partly also because of the fact that, as Chris pointed out, it takes a lot of time to train that. Yeah. You know, it may be a good time to start uh, it right now. Yeah, for me, they are kind of the dark art somehow. Like all the other stuff is kind of straightforward, but this stuff always feels a bit like, okay, that's advanced. <laughs> I usually hit the wall uh, that it's not very useful for practical applications, uh -huh. uh, at least for me. So, yeah, yeah, hard this to is justify. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah th th there are some practical applications, but, but not, not a lot. For for gun, uh, and the, this is the reason that I I stayed away from gun. But a uh, few weeks ago, I saw a paper. Uh, they try to uh, generate uh, X-rays that is either normal or abnormal uh, with, with certain diseases, and and make training for 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 medical students uh, uh, how a normal X-ray should look like, uh, which which is which is which is interesting. But uh, generally, for, for, for guns, usually they use it for art or something like that, so... Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's but I think I, for, for, for Vision, there is some applications. Like, I was f finding them, but not very much literature, basically for my satellite image stuff. And uh, it was kind of interesting that, that it's, it's kind of there, but not really explored. And I was wondering, because they're just not really effective there, or really hard to tame, or I don't know. But it seems like... Yeah, they took off with all the kind of uh, image morphing and then style transfer and all this kind of stuff, but not something really serious, I guess. I don't know. Mm. I'll probably try them, <laughs> yeah. see what happens. Although, uh, also, I didn't see any Kaggle competition. They 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 need to use the gun, so that, mm -hmm. that maybe maybe because it's not a practical approach to to solve problems. I don't know. Have have you seen any any Kaggle competition needed? Where the uh, winner was again? You mean or? I mean I mean uh, the approach that you should win a Kaggle competition to uh, that that should use GAN. Did you see any Kaggle so, competition for that? I I wouldn't say it's a GAN, but um, you know the the current competition that I'm participating in, the humpback whale competition, it was a playground competition before. And the winner of that competition, I believe, had something called a Siamese neural network. So yeah, Siamese neural network is, is in concept similar, like a GAN, it as a generator and a discriminator. So while it is not exactly a GAN, but that was what he used to get the first place in the competition. It's something called- uh, it's, actually, it's actually very different. Uh, Siamese yeah, network is usually in the classification. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just, uh, you have two sides and uh, you cal calculated the cosine distance or uh, hinge loss between them. Um, but uh, I don't think it's uh, similar to GAN. Oh, it's okay. more like uh, to figure out uh, what's the distance between uh, vectors. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe uh, in the sense that it's, it's, it's trying to, to, to check the, the difference between two, two inputs, two images. That's, that's the way that... Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a little bit similar, but, but the, the architecture, I think it's, uh, it's different, yeah. I, I, anyway, gun, guns is, is usually used just for, for style transfer and, and art, and I, I haven't seen any practical applications other than the X-ray training project that 
uh, that was interesting, yeah. So Maybe I, I can. I think that the super resolution um, project is also very interesting, where you take a, a blurry image and make something uh, sharper. Yeah, I, I was. I was to say about the same. It was quite, quite good, like and quite practical, right? To make it more sharper, better quality. That was, that was, that was neat. That was really cool because it was able to fill some areas which was not clear, like uh, f uh, feather birds, uh, feather on birds. That was pretty cool. Uh, wasn't that in in the in the podcast um, of of Sam with the? Um, with this guy basically starting out with neural nets and basically doing the, the this image uh, colorization, or maybe it was in, in a different podcast where they had like black and white images and trained. I think it was a gun to to that basically. Was just his last, his last lesson, I think, lesson seven. He, he uh, in the in the video he showcased that student's work. Yeah, but yeah. I think, uh, let I'll find it. I'll let me find that. That was really cool because that that was like really impressive and. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll try to find it. So while we're just deliberating, I had a question to ask and, 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 and kind of, you know, something dawned on me when I was doing this uh, competition. So basically we use transfer learning to, you know, uh, from ImageNet to see if we can fit into the classes. And if you see the, the last layer, and typically in fast year, what happens is it is a 512 layer. And from there we derive the outputs, whether it is 10 classes, 30 classes, what so be. Right, as long as that number is less than the, uh, you know, the input features, the input features in this case is 512, and the output features is the number of classes that you need to predict, right? Uh, as long as that number is less than that input feature, I believe it, it, it was logical, but in the current competition that I'm working on, the number of classes is 5,005, right? Wow. So I was kind of, you know, looking at it and saying, how can I get 5,005 output features when I have just have 512 input features in the last layer? Right. That was something that was, you know, I don't know whether it is logical to think or whatever, but it was, you know, I was finding it difficult. So any thoughts on that? Is that something normal? Because even in a convolution environment, we start with three channels and using filters, we expand it to 64, then 128 and whatever, and then we come back down sample. So is that something that is normal or is it something that we need to look at? Uh, any thoughts on that? Which competition this one? Uh, come back with well. I see. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe if if you have less features than the classification, then combining two or three features, then then will generate something. So uh, basically, if you have if you have less features, but still the combinations of those features are much more than the classification. And you know, uh, between two layers, uh, you have all the the, the number of uh, I mean uh, number of of connections that the groups that that, that you can take from features to classify one, one class is, is much more uh, than classification number. Okay, so somehow, you know, I was, I was going through the network itself, you know, the model itself. And it kind of starts at 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1004, 2048, and then it kind of comes back, right? 1024, 512, and then the number of classes. Yeah. That was logical, as long as the outputs were less than the number of things to that but if you if you feel that it is it is normal then you know maybe it is I, I somehow always like you know how can this be did did you try to change the the i think you are you are you are rest, restricted to to the type of, of of the architectures that we have right the resnet yeah i i have no experience you know these types of 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 changing the architecture to a custom one will come in part two uh i'm 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 interested in but 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 i i didn't get through the part two of of last last year uh you you, you can you can you can take out the the, the head and, and and change it with whatever exactly head that so you, that yeah. is what i was thinking that i need to create a custom head right and not yeah, a yeah. default cut that is there in past AI. But yes, yeah. you know, you know, everything that I do with this competition has been a journey and a revelation in fast yeah. AI, right yeah. from getting that uh, fast AI to kind of, you know, kind of do the train and the validation, you know, split because many of the classes, 3000 classes have just have one image in this competition, right? So just imagine if there is this one image per class, how do I split that into a train and validation set? 
right? It's it's a classic case of majority class being rampant and minority class being really, really less. And how is your ranking uh, between the others? Uh, for- so myself and, and Sanyam have been there together for this competition. And, and currently my leaderboard, now our leaderboard score is 0.593. And the, and the top score is 0.2, 0.942. 0.9, 4, is, it, is, uh, is this public leaderboard or private? This is the public one because the private leaderboard is at the end of the competition or towards the end, I believe. So, okay. So, so you, uh, you've got there might be some part? people cheating there. I don't know if they have cheated. There are a lot of people who have done it. And, uh, you know, I find Radek has also joined the competition and he's got a score of 0.760. Right, and he's used just fast AI, right? And I have not seen anybody use the fast AI current version apart from me and Radak as of now, for whatever I have seen. The, the, pe- the people who have scores around 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8 have used the fast AI version 2, and they have scores about 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8. So, how was that solution of Radak? Did he, did he make a baseline uh, Kaggle kernel? I don't think he's made a Kaggle kernel, it is there in his GitHub. So I went to his GitHub and kind of saw what he has done. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to see, you know, what, what we can replicate from that. And he just did uh, ResNet, a uh, normal architecture, right? Didn't oh, yes. So yeah. what, what I understand that they have done is they have kind of taken out the majority class and just taken the minority classes and, and done the training. And when it comes to kind of doing the prediction for the final, uh, they take a certain threshold and if the predictions are be, you know, below the threshold, they take that you know, majority class as the main, main prediction. So it's, it's a very new thing that I've also kind of come across. The majority of what he, he made? So for example, there is one particular class, uh, which is 9,664 images out of a total of 25,000 images in the training set. So what they do is they take out that particular class train it on the rest of the classes, which means 5,004 classes. And then they do the, the prediction on the test set, right? But the, they wait for the uh, probability score. So if the probability say is, uh, you know, 0. 0.5 for the class that it is predicted, uh, uh, they, it's okay. But if it is less than 0. 0.3 or 0. 0.4, whatever is your, is your threshold that you set. And if the prediction for the class is less than that, then by default, they take that majority class as the, as the prediction. It's a, it's a kind of new thing. I think They're just the exploiting the distribution of statistics uh, in a data set. Uh, if, the tr- if the test set is going to have different distribution, it might really uh, fire back. Yeah, but... I- the, the winning, uh, or I wouldn't say winning, at least the, the top scores in the kernels are all using this, this kind of, uh, you know, method. You know the winning uh, solution? Did you read the first winning solution of quick draw? Uh, they, 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 they check the, the, the distribution of the test set and yeah. then uh, you, they, change, they change the probabilities. Uh, I mean... I don't remember exactly, but they, 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 they take, take into consideration the, how is the distribution of the test set. So uh, maybe that's f- something very important also. Uh, if, 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 if in the test set, the, the, the majority is, is a certain kind of class, then you should, you should uh, make a bias in your, in your classification to that class also. So. Yeah. I went to that particular kernel and, and, you know, there are four or five important concepts in there. I'm trying to implement one by one. The mm-hmm. first one is a bounding box, right? So he has kind of created a bounding box by which he's cropping the image of that tail of the whale, uh, you know, and, and he has taken that for prediction. That's number one. Then he, of course, he's created the Siamese neural network kind of, kind of doing this. Then he's also got something called an image hash to check if there are duplicates of the training images in the test set images. And if they are so, then you automatically take the labels of the training and affix them to the test set and, and so forth. There are four or five things. And to do each one of them, right, for a person like me and Ansanyam who are just, you know, also getting started, it, it's, it's a time by itself to kind of understand and do it. So, <laughs> But that's something where I, I personally always think, okay, it's, it's, it's to win the Kaggle thing, but why, why do this kind of stuff, right? I mean, 
to to identify if the test image is the same as in in the train image and then assign the label i mean that never happens in in your work life right i mean that's kind of for me it feels like okay sure improve, improve your score but it's like a bit but it, it it's complicated. well but 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 that kind of makes sense so like the 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 guitar classifier christian you did but yeah. so you just took the thousands of images, but it could be it could be same images sometimes, right? Because Google has Google images. It could yeah, be but different not, name. not with, with my uh, super great fast class thing because I, I take image hashes, hashes, so I check. Oh, them. oh, great, cool. Okay, <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, because I was thinking. Yeah, I was thinking. So potentially, I, I'm getting images from three search engines, so there will be duplicates. That's why I do a hash of the of the image. By hash, you mean like uh, the some uh, some pixels? There's some a Python pixels. Python library for for getting a, a hash of the pixel values, basically. Yeah, it's, of the pixel values. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's basically the name can differ, but but if the, it's the same pixel values, then it will get the same score. But it's yeah, it's cool. Not good. I mean, if 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 it's a, a resampled or whatever, it's 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 still not detected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there was there was a there's a blog post that Jeremy was retweeting. There's a guy. Who's helping them with the library? He wrote a uh, a code and a post on how to on how to detect similar looking images or identical images. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's a, this kind of way how to do it and then get rid of that. Uh, just, also, just as a heads, heads up, I found this link. So if anyone is interested, uh, that was from a different podcast. Um, I put it in the chat because this uh, this is really impressive, and that's done with uh, guns as well. Basically, colorizing old images and that that's really cool not really super useful but if you have some turn of the century images <laughs> yeah. yeah anyway uh, but by, by the way a side topic uh, just for you who are interested in uh, reinforcement learning i was just like you i i i wanted to to learn it a long time ago but uh, when i i read an article by andre karpathy uh, he 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 was uh, he was one of the uh, researchers on open AI mm -hmm. who, who worked about uh, on, on reinforcement learning. Uh, I, I, I literally turned off uh, on uh, re reinforcement learning. Here's the, the link. Just check it out before diving in in this topic. Uh, I think this is the reason that uh, Jeremy is, is not interested in. Uh, if, you, if you check it out, you will see how it is a very, very narrow uh, research field and, and cannot be applied to large uh, uh, large types of, 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 of topics in real life. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's very interesting. You know Andre Andre Carpathy. Yeah. You know, yeah. Very very. Yeah. So this is a good to uh, article on this topic. Hi there. Is this the Pong from Pixels article? Pardon. Is this the Pong from Pixels article that you are talking about? Uh, about reinforcement learning. Yeah, and it says Pong from Pixels by... Uh, yeah. yeah, I just clicked on the link. It's deep reinforcement learning Pong from Pixels. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. you're right, you're right. Yeah. Okay, thanks for the link. Yeah, yeah. So anybody who's willing to, who's wanting to look at reinforcement learning, I think should start with the David Silver's course. That's rated as the number one starting point at least for uh, reinforcement lane. I have not Which seen a course, David Silva. Can, can you um, put a link for it? Sure, I'll, I'll put it across. So okay. that's, that's, I think, a couple of years old at least as of now, but it's, it's still rated as the number one go-to resource for reinforcement learning. I did try my hand at reinforcement learning and, and, and none of it was at least intuitive for me, right? After a certain point of time beyond the reward and the, uh, you know, the environment and the, and the kind of actions you can take, uh, it was not so intuitive anymore for me. But having said that, I did not spend the time that I spent on deep learning uh, in reinforcement learning. Uh, so There's yeah. also a 2018 uh, ebook from Pact that's supposed to be quite good. Um, I'll try to find the link. By the way, VJ, uh, for, for, for your uh, live competition, the humpback, how do you discuss with others? Because I, I'm sold out. I, I joined your, your, your group uh, for the humpback competition. 
so right now it's me and and uh, Sanyam who have uh, been the the team. Yeah. So we both are doing that. So yeah, we can we can discuss it offline now, either with three of us. Uh, it's luck. Sorry. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. The private, private. Uh... Yeah. Uh, so it, we are yeah. discussing the fast AI uh, study group Slack. I see. The Asia study group Slack. Yeah. 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 All right. So let me just put the link of this David Silver's course here. Yeah, there you go. So that's I've shared the link of the course from David Silver. Thank you. So we are just reaching the end of the hour. So are we, we are good or should we continue a bit more? Do we have more things to discuss? Um, so I don't know. To, uh, we just need to put that uh, agenda for the next couple of weeks and just assign some guys to kind of open the calls and then uh, I don't know, I think we should be good. Just sure. go from there, right? Sure. So maybe in the Slack we can put a, a link for people to submit their willingness to do the be the host and, and yeah how to do it should 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 it be as a is a, some sort of Google Doc or because you cannot modify the right you cannot modify the Slack post but maybe we could do like a poll so we can put dates and then whoever wants to uh, host it can click on it right Would that work well. I can try to do it. I'll try to do it. Okay. Okay. Great. okay. Uh, a question from the chat that David Silver is is the guy who is teaching self-driving cars. No, he's not the same guy. Uh, I think he's is is a professor in, in Oxford University, okay. right? David Silver of reinforcement learning. Uh, I'm not sure, but I have not heard the name David Silver being associated with flying cars as well. So. Yeah, yeah, he's a different guy. Yeah, I know, I know about him. Also, Kaggle kernels. Now uh, you can run fast AI v1 on Kaggle kernels, and some guys already ported some kernels, but they are not public, I think, because yeah, of course. Uh, oh, that's actually licensed. something. That's something I wanted to ask. Forgot, forgot about it. How is everyone settled in on where and how they do their their models? I mean. I know a couple of you do like uh, local machines, but because I was uh, switching a couple of them back and forth and I'm not, I'm still not quite happy. So I'm currently at, at uh, Google machines, but it's, it feels a bit tedious. What, how are you doing? Like is, is anyone switching to the Docker style of play or any best practices that emerge? I'm using P2 instances on AWS. Okay. Works pretty good. Okay. It's about uh, uh, NVIDIA TI-60 performance level. Um, works pretty good. Okay. I've been using paper space. Um, um, it's it's not not bad actually, um, but it you know it is it isn't free. Uh, it costs something like uh, uh, fifty cents per hour. Oh no, sorry, um, I got that wrong. It's uh, I can't remember how much per hour, but it's one of the one of the less expensive options, and uh, and it it works pretty well. And and you're all in in Jupyter's notebooks because they they really drive me up the wall. I don't know. Yeah, I'm using their gradient uh, uh, their gradient uh, uh, platform on on paper space, and the only problem is that every time you update, uh, every time you update, for, you have to update the FastAI library from GitHub, and then you have to um, um, let's see, and there's two things you have to do before every session. You have to do that, and when it done, when you do that, it actually uh, erases any notebook that you have with the, it. Right, overwrites any notebook that you have with the same name. So, um, and it also doesn't save your notebooks in that in the fast AI directories. So the workaround is you build your own. Um, they give you a storage directory that that is persistent storage and it's something like 50 gigabytes or something like that. So anytime you 
you work on a notebook, after you finish it, you save it in this storage directory somewhere, and mm -hmm. then you'll have it available next time you start up. Otherwise, your notebooks will be gone. And so it took a little while to learn that, but once that was done, everything's smooth. Yeah, I was, I don't know what it is, if it's my local connection here or whatever, but I, I'm always getting kind of dead connection to these notebooks oh, uh, channels, and that's really frustrating. Yeah. So I, I started like for the longer um, NLP stuff I was doing uh, with Fast AI, I actually wrote scripts, command line scripts, because it was just... Christian, did you try Tmax? Tmax is the solution. No, not yet. I, I, I know that I should. Yeah. Tmax. Yeah. Is, but is it, isn't Google isn't Google Cloud using not using Tmax? I think they used that by it's, default. It's, it's very much there. The Tmax is there in GCP. I use the GCP yeah. and I use and I have a P hundred. Okay. Uh, but when I have to run these long kind of uh, notebooks, I generally do the uh, you know VNC, and then I keep the uh, you know thing running. And and if, even if it closes off, I can go back to NC at any point of time. That has yeah. worked really well for me. Okay. Uh, how did you use uh, VNC? I'm interested in that too. So yeah, I, I can you know uh, probably uh, okay. So if you have seen the the version two of the course from Jeremy, uh, he introduced us to VNC and how to install it on AWS and get that working. So I used that and I had to do a little bit of modification to get that working on GCP. But it's a simple, straightforward process. It's about probably two three lines of code that you need to copy paste and then go edit a certain file. Uh, and then you're uh, set on uh, then whenever you get the GCP instance up, you get the IP of the external IP address of that instance. And then you're able to use it on your Mac. I have a Mac, so I use the screenshot yeah. of the map and I am able to see that. Is, is it in part two uh, of last year or part one? Uh, it was in part two of last year, but I can, I can send, that, send the details to you separately. That would be uh, interesting to me as well. Yeah, that would be cool. I'll, I'll do that. I'll probably, you know, send those details separately. Because I'm not even sure if, if I can, like, if, if, a, if a kernel connection kind of dies, if I can reconnect to this. I, I'm still not clear, like, if, if the connection between your Python kernel in the background and your Jupyter kind of front end is, is disconnected, if, if you can reconnect, because it, it shows busy and then NVIDIA RAM is, is occupied. But I never managed to actually, like, Log, log into that kernel again. So it uh, yeah, always have to the same problem. Even though there's an option to reconnect. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't, it never worked with me. So I was just, I, I wasn't sure if I'm just stupid or if it's just not, not, not happening. It's pretty so, known uh, for SSH is not reliable. It's, it's, it's yeah. something that's known. Uh, I heard a lot, but the, you know, the gold standard is to use Tmax. Yeah, Every I, time I should, when you I should definitely yeah. do it, you know. I was using uh, Mosh, if I was using that from MIT, that's like a, kind of uh, um, a wrapper over SSH that, that uh, I was using the, on the train basically to prevent timeouts and you get kind of a, a cache of your command line cursor and stuff like that. But I should just use Tmux, yeah. Definitely. yeah the, the only thing with the VNC server is it'll take some amount of your disk space because you need to install a, a very lightweight Ubuntu desktop. Yeah. Right? So it'll take some amount of your uh, disk storage. So you must at least have 100 GB of disk storage uh, not this is not going to take 100 GB, but no, no, I was going to say you can just yeah. use a really lightweight X server thingy. Yeah, but it'll it'll take about two two to three GB of your uh, space for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, this is another problem I had. So is, uh, my ad block was interfering with uh, reconnecting to existing kernels, so I have to disable ad block before. Uh, connected to existing kernels. So on the in, in, in your browser, your ad blocker was kind of interfering. Yes. Okay. Uh, it was working in Chrome, and that was like odd because I, I don't have uh, any ad block in, in Chrome. It was always reconnected. Try to disable if you use. Uh, oh, that's a, that's a good tip. What, was it? Uh, are you on a Mac? Was it Safari? Uh, I use Firefox, and it's Mac. Yes. Okay. Mm, so I was right. getting four four in logs uh, that it could could not re. Yeah. Uh, one more thing about VNC server, it's not to be used when you're kind of doing your notebooks, you know, you're writing your notebooks and you're kind of doing it from scratch. It's not pretty intuitive to do that. If you want to have a notebook and you want to keep that running for long, then of course, I know I'd recommend you to use VNC server, right? Uh, because you're going to kind of uh, go into another desktop and, and write on top of that in the browser, it's, yeah. it will have a certain lag. So lag, that experience yeah. is not going to be great. Okay. Cool, I'll definitely try that, yeah. 
Okay. So, so our, our so, um, item then is if we want to participate in this um, Chicago competition in the interim, we should all go and make sure we fill out that uh, that document uh, that uh, Hyder has made. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah. Um, Hyder, could you make a link to that document? Because I seem to have lost it. Yes, sure, sure. So here it is. Uh, uh, it's already in the chat, right? Yeah, yeah, in the chat. You can see the last link. Oh, in the chat, okay. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, one more thing. Uh, I, 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 I'm trying to learn Keras now. I, I actually, actually, Keras is 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 something that I I, I loved f f two years ago, uh, and now I I almost forget it. But trying to refresh what I know uh, about Keras, the, the the good thing in Keras is that uh, there are a lot of uh, examples online. Uh, so for example, the paper here that mentioned about CME's network. Uh, I think it's, it's not easy to, to, to do it in fast AI, at least currently. Fast AI uh, shines when, 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 when you want to, to take the cutting edge Im implementation and all the nuances of, of, of uh, uh, latest research about something. But the problem is that the models that, that you are uh, offered is still limited, pretty limited. Uh, while in Keras, you have all uh, types of researchers, they are sharing their code and, and, and so on. It's so, also true uh, for, for jobs. I, I was, I'm just applying for jobs and it's always TensorFlow and Keras. It's, it's crazy. It's like the other stuff is only academia, PyTorch and, and I mean, Obviously, it's 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 great when you when you know it, but but it's like uh, the the one thing that I always see listed is TensorFlow. Yeah, yeah, because I could deploy it at scale and cloud. And that's probably yeah. The apparently, so I mean, apparently they're kind of merging, right? Like like TensorFlow is getting this dynamic um, tree execu execution, but I haven't really looked at that. And and PyTorch with a one O has a C plus plus inference kind of thing, and like deployment additions. Apparently, haven't looked at that. But I found PyTorch, a PyTorch task. Please go ahead. Yeah, TensorFlow has always had uh, the eager execution, the early eager execution that has been at least for the last two, three, four versions. I think the latest version is coming out more or less with that dynamic kind of a uh, you know map, which instead of the static map that it used to have or the static graph that it used to have. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it's getting there. Uh, but you know, my take on it is if you get one framework right, whether it is PyTorch or whether it is TensorFlow, it's kind of easy to then go to the next and be able to adapt to that, right? Yeah. I just so, thought like if, yeah. if since it's such a requirement, I, I definitely also want to get a bit more into TensorFlow Keras, just so I can say. Uh, what, one thing uh, is uh, if you want to do custom heads, I think PyTorch is easier to do that. Yeah. Uh, because in Keras, it takes much more code to, uh, and I think Jeremy mentioned that as well. Yeah, yeah that's true. I mean, uh, I don't know if you know that there's this uh, this um, book from 2018, beginning of 2018, the Keras book. That's yeah, the author really of Keras. Really yeah. good, I mean, I'm, I'm reading that. I'm, I'm almost in, in the, I, I finish all the first quarter of the book and it's mm -hmm. pretty, pretty easy. Yeah, I was Keras, starting that Keras before we started FastAI. So I was also just about starting that and then kind of put it on hold. So Is this the deep learning with uh, Python by Francois Cholet? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Very nice book. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's on my Christmas list as well. To, to so you, your opinion is, is to stick with PyTorch more than Keras? Uh, so it depends. My, my suggestion would be to stick with the framework where you spend the most time on, right? If it is TensorFlow care, I'll stick to that. If it is PyTorch, stick to that. Get one thing right and then, you know, it, I would say it's kind of easy to go to the next one. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, there are two books coming on PyTorch. Uh, one is, I think, in January 2018 is uh, O'Reilly book. And uh, another one is uh, in the progress of writing on... Uh, Mining called uh, by something deep learning with PyTorch. Uh, I'm going through that one and it's pretty good. So it gives, uh, v it starts from very basic uh, information 
and goes up to building CNNs and uh, all that advanced architectures. So highly recommend. So that's version one, I, I figure if it's really new. Uh, yeah, I think, I think they're very new. Uh, yeah, but they're, covering, those... they're covering PyTorch one, right? Because I mean, no, no point learning on, on, on an old version of PyTorch. I haven't seen the one which is coming to, in 2019. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, the Madden version is, uh, I think it's focused on uh, at what was available, but it's still in the right. And I think they got, yeah, it's this one. Okay. Um, I guess they're going to switch to version one and probably have to rewrite some things, but it's still very useful. Okay. So, so you're reading that right now? That's the one you're working with? Uh, yeah, I'm reading this one right now. Okay. It's still not complete, right? Uh, so the first six chapters is, uh, is released. What's That's correct. It? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So much to read. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, yeah he, he, the, the other book is already this one. I think yeah, this one. Yes, I think it's this one. But I haven't haven't read anything about it. Uh, I think it's supposed to be version one. Yeah. Okay. Guys, I think we are reaching about fifteen minutes past the scheduled time. Are we still good to go? I would have to be for guys. So next week, same day, same same day, same time. Yeah. Okay. Um, great. And Haider, please, you know, let us connect offline on the on the competition on the Fast AI Asia Study Group Slack. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And tomorrow again for machine learning. <laughs> yeah. Right. Lesson eleven. Two more to go. Right on. All right. Okay, excellent. See you next week. Okay. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. See you, see you, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.